Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Bless. Okay, I'm now blessed for 15 years, married to my wonderful, beautiful wife, and now we have a little girl, which is, I still can't believe it, to be honest with you, I still can't believe it, and uh, God is, God is so good, uh, praise the Lord, God is so good. How many got fed this morning? Did you get fed this morning? Did you get a different perspective on entitlement and on uh, the prodigal son parable? We really broke it down from two perspectives, the younger son and the father. And tonight we're going to look at the older son and the father. And again, so the title of tonight's message is the danger, the danger of entitlement. An entitlement where folks just believe they are entitled to certain things. They're entitled to certain things from their parents, entitled, for, ent entitled to certain things from their boss at work. Entitled for certain things from their teacher at school. We have, we're have entitled to certain things from the government. We are entitled from certain things even from the church. Where we believe certain things are our right. Okay? And we look at where when one develops a sense of entitlement. And that sense is incorrect. Or that sense is filled out of greed. If that sense is developed out of a wrong motive and selfishness. Then it will very quickly become a danger in a wrong road to go down. As we learned this morning, the younger son, as he wanted his entitlement, he desired to have his inheritance before his father even died. And we know that he went out and, and brought forth prodigal living or wasteful living and squandered everything. He became so desperate as a Jew that he had to eat from the same feed that he was giving to the pigs in a faraway country. We find, church, that desperate people do desperate things. However, we also find with a true repentant heart, with someone whose life has been changed, when someone sees the light, kind of like that old Hank Williams Sr. song of 1939, I saw the light, when church, just as we find in Luke 15, verse 17, but when he came to himself, or when he got out of that selfish mode, when he saw the light, he realized that he had sinned against heaven and against his father, and therefore repented of his sin. The problem was, as the father saw this true repentance, the father got so excited and celebrated almost to the point of celebrating into sinful activity to where he began, as we're going to find tonight, to forget all about the older son's inheritance, the older son's things that he was entitled to upon his father's death. For example, fat, the fatted calf and other uh, robes and sandals that truly belonged to the older son. The father was so excited he began to do things that went against the law, that went against the custom there in Israel. Kind of like when a football team, the fans go so bananas, they start rioting in the streets. They start looting places, burning cars, and their team won. Their team won, and there's all this damage that takes place. Matter of fact, the NFL sets out in their budget, they set out money to go to the teams in the Super Bowl because they know their cities are going to be damaged, if not destroyed, whether it's the winner or the loser. The NFL pays for a lot of that city to be rebuilt every single year. You know, that's part of their budget. And church, it's so important that we grasp and know that even with repentance, even with someone coming to a right relationship with God, understanding the dangers of entitlement, don't go so far in your excitement that rather than having, you know, one step forward, and you know the old saying, one step forward, two steps back, you know, you go one step forward, ten steps back, you know, you go in the wrong direction because you're so excited that you forget common sense, you forget logic, you forget truth, and you kind of just always, oh, this is so exciting, so let's just do something that's going to send forth hypocrisy or send forth contradiction, and we're going to find tonight with part two of this series, the older son, as he's out working, doing what he's been doing since day 
21, being obedient to his father. And when he's out working and he gets wind that the fatted calf that is to be, you know, cooked, if you will, cut and cooked for him upon his father's death as the, as the torch is passed, is being cut and cooked because the, the prodigal son has come home and that, that the father has ordered this and that the father is forgetting the well-being and the entitlement due his older son and things are kind of going down the drain very quickly, we're going to see that the older son was already thinking about what was due him upon his father's death. Has anybody here ever had, you know, it's one thing when your teenage children or your, your, your school-age children are at odds against each other, but has anybody here ever had two adult children at odds against each other and they would not talk? That's very painful. That's very painful to where, or you have two siblings that are in their 50s going against each other. Maybe you have what's called the black sheep in the family, or maybe, you know, you have that, that oddball, or you have that pain, or you have, you know, people calling up, so-and-so going to be there, yes, yeah, so-and-so's there, well, I'm not going. That type of pain and that type of discomfort. Well, church, we're going to find that it's the father in this story that did not understand the dangers of entitlement. This morning, as I was preaching part one, I, I didn't share it, but I'm going to share it tonight, that I find parents of any age here. Because as long as long as you're breathing, you're still mom and dad, right? 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 That's what I find for my mom and dad. No matter how old I get, they're still calling to see how I'm doing. You know, and giving advice, giving counsel. That's what parents do. All right? And so, the, uh, but let me just say this. Parents, and no matter how old you are, if you understand the dangers of entitlement, I believe, I believe the, 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 the rest, I believe the solution, I believe the answer to the dangers of entitlement could very well lie with you. That's a big responsibility, I know. But if you understand, as the book of James declares, that parents should not, and Christians, should not show favoritism to one child over another. I believe, church, that if you grasp and understand, if you grasp and understand the dangers of entitlement, the answer to all the probate problems we're having today in court, the answer to problems like this that deal with the dangers of entitlement, I believe can be solved. Think about it. As we, as we finish this at the end, ask yourself the question, how could, the, how could this have been a prevented? What could the father have done? What could the father have done to, to prevent the older son from getting upset? Is there something that the father could have done to keep the younger son from going and blowing it? How about not giving it to him in the first place? You know, when we look at this, and most of the time when you look at the prodigal son, we get all excited. It's kind of like the, the, the Disney movie, you know, or kind of like any movie where there's a happy ending and the son just comes home and there's a great big party and praise the Lord. We kind of we even refer to it sometimes in service. You know, the son comes home. Well, think about this. You know what would have been happier if, it, if he never went away in the first place? Think about how desperate he was. And, but we all get excited about that son, but very seldom do we look at things from the older son's perspective. Well, tonight we're going to do that. Why? Because there's danger to entitlements. There's problems. Anybody here ever been in probate court because there was a mess going on with you or your siblings over an estate? Have you ever been in probate court because there wasn't a will that defined things and it gets real hairy, it gets real ugly, you get brothers squalling at each other, sometimes they got to get police officers in there. I've been in there. I know. I know what happens. But church, if we understand the dangers of entitlement, God's hand can move mightily and great things can happen. If you guys would stand for, with me for the reading of God's Word, and we're going to be looking tonight at Luke chapter 15. Jesus again speaking, and we're going to be reading verse 25 to 32 here tonight. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Luke 15, beginning with verse 25, and this is all words of bread, all words of our Lord speaking in this particular passage of Scripture. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because of, 
And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now it's interesting, church, as this parable ends, kind of, or this illustration ends, I should say, with a, with a uh, kind of a cliffhanger. And we have to read between the lines. We have to look very carefully at the intent of Jesus Christ. And many times I've heard it said that this is, you know, the, the, this is the father, the, the father of these two boys is playing the role of Father God and all this kinds of stuff. But we have to look at the complete, complete context, which is why you have to, which was why we had to read, you know, all uh, 21 verses from verse 11 to 32 uh, here tonight and this morning. This is why we have to grasp fully what's, what's going on because the father, even to the very end, is believing that he was right. But we're going to break this down as we did this morning to grasp and to understand the dangers of entitlement. Because one thing about entitlement, it's kind of like sin, you know, it's where it's contagious. If we have the wrong sense of entitlement, that too is contagious. That's going to affect someone else, especially when you start passing along something that's due someone else and you give it to somebody else because of the celebration, of the excitement, you know. And, and think about it, we've never seen any dialogue at all between the two sons. We never saw any dialogue between the father and the older son. The older son was out working. And the father was making decisions without consenting the one in which the fatted goat and the other things was entitled to. Church, sometimes, parents, this is where you can, you can understand this is really important, parents, that if you know that if you know that one particular item belongs to one of your children, it would be really nice before you give that item to another child if you get consent from that first child that it belongs to. I've had situations in 12 years of ministry. Well, well, it, I just thought they'd be okay, and I thought it'd be okay, and I let them drive the car, and you know, and, and that, you know, whatever. I tell you what, when I was growing up, and my mother, who's the only one who had a set of keys to my car, if she had given that to my brother to drive, something had been going on in Dixie. <laughs> I'd have been really upset. You guys know how I felt about my car, and I paid for that car, and I worked hard for that car, and he drives like a maniac. <laughs> He was really bad in those days. He spun us out many times. Just crazy. I don't know. And then wanted to be a police officer. That's, that's how he rolled. And if my mother had given, oh, just Jonathan, I see your car's broke down. Take, take your brother's car. He'll be all right with it. You know, whatever. I'd have been furious. Now, if she had called me and said, just, uh, your, your brother's car broke down. And, you know, I, I just wanted to see if it'd be okay. He promised he'd drive slow. And if anything happens to it, I'll fix it. That's what I've been listening for my, at that age of my life. Then I would have said, okay. But, church, this is what happens. Parents, this is what happens. This is what we talked about youthfulness this morning and kind of the role of entitlement and kind of stirred the young people a little bit, I hope. I want to stir you tonight. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Okay, and if, you, and if you can understand this, because this is what the one kid's going to think that has the, has the thing maybe that they've worked for or bought or taken care of, and you give permission for someone else to use it, this is what starts happening. You're playing favorites. You don't care about me. And the things that I'm entitled to aren't important to you. And then you start feeling hostility. And then you, you question what's going on. It would just be really cool, parents. Just ask them. Just talk to them. And today with cell phones, shoot them a text. You know, send them a Facebook. 
All right, because one thing I'll be honest with you, when I work with kids and young people, if they bring valid points, I let them know it's a valid point. You guys know that, not as I don't do as I don't do as I say, do you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. That type of thing, parents, we know that doesn't work. Your kids have a valid point with that. Okay? That's hypocrisy. When you're living a different message, but you're telling your kid to live one way and you live in another way, that doesn't work. And this is the one thing with teenagers that I get a lot, is that my parents don't care about me. They have a favorite child. They don't care about the things I'm entitled to, and they do X, Y, and Z. You know, and, and that pushes your kid away. Well, here we're going to find that when the older son, and the, the father did not have a conversation with him, and took matters into his own hands because he could, because he's dad. He's dad. Well, just because you're dad doesn't mean your children don't have things that are entitled to them or that they even have feelings, if you will, or that their opinion should not be consulted. Okay, and if you just take matters into your own hands, you're going to alienate your child. And that's what happens here. The older son, and you could even argue, some even call him the faithful son, who was doing exactly what the oldest son is supposed to do. But the father, in his celebration, did not consult him. And then he goes on to defend his point. And then what happens? The parable ends. It's kind of like the book of Jonah. Where does it go from here? Well, church, let me just say this to you. And then we're going to break down the verse. It's kind of a longer intro today than normal. But this is really important. This is really important with understanding this, this parable of Scripture. And it's really important with understanding the dangers of entitlement. Okay? And that is this. Once a parent or a child or an adult has a perception, sometimes that perception becomes reality. How does that per perception form when we don't understand true entitlement and the difference between true entitlement and a sense of entitlement? This morning we looked at the sense of entitlement. Tonight we're looking at true entitlement which means what, what is mine? Remember the promises of God that we talked about? And what are we entitled to? You know, and, and that comes down to common sense, logic, possessions, inheritance, feelings of others. All this kinds of thing are really important. And church, this is breaking families. This is breaking families. You know, when they have Thanksgiving, they eat at home alone because they have no family to go to. Christmas time comes and it's a miserable time of year for many Christians because they can't celebrate it with their own blood relatives. Very painful, but a lot of it comes back to entitlement. Entitlement. So let's break it down tonight from the older son's perspective and look at the father in the midst of this. And it's great. It's wonderful. The younger son has come home. The younger son has gotten right with God. But notice he didn't go and get right with the brother. Notice, you know, this is what you have to do. If you come to Christ or you, you come to forgiveness and you get right with one, you have to get right with everybody else if you can. You know, just don't expect the pastor to go call everybody. We have to make phone calls. We have to, you know, extend an olive branch the best we can. And it's, and it's you know, with a simple repentance. But that doesn't happen. The one who was truly earned, if you will, the birthright, because simply he's the oldest, the one who had paid his dues, had, had been looking forward to this entitlement upon his father's death, hadn't squandered a thing, and as we found, the, the father hadn't even given him a young goat to have a party with, which meant he never even allowed him or permitted or gave him permission to have a celebration. A young goat was not even offered to him at a faithful service. And so that tells us that there's deep resentment between the older son and the younger son. And you would have to believe that the father would have known that. You would have to believe that over those many years that there would be conversation. There would be many things taking place. There would have been uh, many uh, conversation about, hey, I wonder where younger brother is. I can't believe he squandered. I can't believe he left you high and dry. You know, I can't believe he's hanging out with harlots. I can't believe he did all those things. But the father forgot that. And then we have a problem. Verse 25. Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He hadn't been a witness to any of this repentance. 
He had not been a witness to the younger son coming back, seeing the lights, had not seen his father chase after the younger son as he's coming down the street, running to him, and, and he had not seen any of that. He had been doing what he was supposed to be. He was being a good son. He was working hard. He was working for what was due him or what was he was entitled to upon his father's death. He knew the harder he worked, the more the estate built up, the, the more farm he had, the more he would have upon his father's death. And so he was working. He was doing what he was supposed to do. He was doing it. And then he heard music. The Bible says in verse 25, he heard music and he heard and he saw dancing and there was a great celebration going on. Now this would have been very abnormal. This would have been very unusual. This would have been very shocking in the middle of the day to have a party breaking out. And so verse 26 tells us, so the older son called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. So basically he's saying to his servants, what's going on? What's happening here? Why is there a party in the middle of the day? What, what's taking place? Completely unaware, completely oblivious to what's going on. But actually what's happening behind the scenes is that the things that he was entitled to were going bye-bye. Because there's only one fatted calf. There's only one robe. There's only one set of sandals. There's only, you know, one set of entitlement that's due. Remember, the older son is due a double portion simply because of his birthright. He's, and it's things are happening behind the scenes. Families, young people, adults, you need to know and understand that there's things going on behind the scenes. Parents, I would encourage you to ask your children, if you have multiple children, say, hey, Peggy Sue, do you think I have a favor? Ask them a tough question. Do you think I love your sibling over you or more than you? And simply say, give me an honest answer. Be prepared for what you might hear. You say, Pastor, well, you don't understand. We get along better. She's more obedient. Well, here we had a son that did what he was supposed to do. But something was going on behind the scenes. You know, we're to love our children equally. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Here. We're the family of God. I should love Chris as my brother just as much as I love Vince or Brandon or Brady or Toby or Zach or anybody else here, Ron, anybody. Shouldn't be showing favorites. Same thing in the family of God. But so what happens? Sometimes people, well, I've, I've known Crystal longer than anybody else here other than my wife and her parents. I've known Crystal for 12 years. We go way back, boss, do Okay? So she can sit back and say, well, I'm entitled to more of his time because I've known him longer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But when you think about it, that's how things start up in church splits. That's how these small, small things, because why? There's something behind the scenes going. When our kids run away, that just doesn't happen overnight. And the parents say, I was so shocked. What's going on? What's going on? And a lot of times it's because it's the dangers of entitlement. They're gone. What happened? What's taking place? So parents, ask your kids. Wait, ask for them for an honest opinion. Obviously, they may be justified, they may not be, but at least you'll know what their perception is. You will know how you're coming across to them. You will know how you can pray. You will know, wow, I need to, I need to work on this. I need to uh, trust the Lord many times. And, and, and my older brother and sister, they always thought I was, Darren and I were the favorites, you know, because we, we, we liked music and we got saved and, and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 all, and I remember telling my dad, I said, Dad, you've got to stop boasting in me. You've got to stop bragging on me because you, you, need to, you need to be proud of all four of your children. Now, that wasn't easy for me to do, but I saw what was happening, and I saw it was alienating not only Dad and my older brother, but my older brother and myself. I could see it was setting in. I could see no matter what he did, and whether it was academically, whether it was spiritually, no matter if it was financially, it was never the same. It was always, look at what Just is doing. And look at what Darren is doing. And, and, and all those kinds, and, and so this is really a serious stuff, church, because there's something behind the scenes working. And guess what? What's in the darkness will always come to the light. Will always come to the light. And we're going to see 
Where, what's in the darkness, what's behind the scenes, what in this entitlement piece is going to come to the light. Just like the younger son who squandered everything and he was so desperate, his darkness came to the light when he realized, I have to eat pig food. Not only do I have to feed him this, I, that's my lunch too. And he's a Jew, which is, which is an ultimate insult. Things could not have gotten worse for the younger, the younger son. There's no way things could have gotten worse for him. He was at the low of lows. Verse number, verse number uh, 26 again says, So he called one of the servants and asked, What is going on? What, what these things meant? What's happening? Verse 27, And the servant said to him, Your brother has come. Wow. Now we're going to get to the nitty gritty. We're going to get to true entitlement and a sense of entitlement. We're going to get to the heart of an issue. We're going to get to the place that uh, the father is going to have to really start making some tough decisions. We're going to find out that I believe the father really didn't know his older son as well as he thought. Now some argue that maybe the older son had already had plans with his inheritance. And I believe he did. And I believe that's probably wise to have plans. You just don't wait for somebody or hope somebody kicks the bucket for you to seize that money. You, you pray that your parents live a long time. You pray that they will be with us. And, a, and obviously he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was not out doing anything uh, contrary to that. He certainly didn't go to his father and ask for his in, in, inheritance in advance. He was being obedient. He was doing what he was, what he was supposed to do. And then it says in verse 27, he said to him, your brother has come home and because he has received him, the he there is referring to his father, your father has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Wow. Can you say insult? There's only one fatted calf. And it's now been offered up for celebration because the younger son came home. Can you imagine true entitlement here? This was to be brought out upon the father's death, upon the changing of the guard from the father to the older son, and the fatted calf has been brought out. That would have been gut-wrenching. Gut-wrenching. And then we're going to get real personal here in just a second as we look at these verses. Church, this is what happens when we have a wrong sense of entitlement or dangers of entitlement. We get blinded so very much we forget about true entitlement. We forget about what, what, is, what, we, what we should receive at appropriate time. We, re, we forget about the value of, of hard work. We forget about the value of being obedient. And all that's out the drain. Now I've heard it preached, well, well, this is because it was so he came home and, 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 the, and the older son should have been rejoicing as well. My brother's come home, my brother's come home. And who's to say he would not have been? But he wasn't consulted. The fatted calf has now been offered up. And the father can do that because he's the father and the servants are going to obey him. Of, of course. He's still in control. He's still the father. He's still calling the shots. But that sense of entitlement True entitlement and the older son's perspective is, 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 is now gone because it's, it's kind of like once virginity, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't get it back. Now God's graceful, he's forgiving, he's loving, of course. But that treasure's gone. And yes, you can start fresh and new, praise the Lord. But there's still something that's been missing here. That fatted calf, once it's been cut, once it's been butchered, once it's been cooked, there's nothing, you can't get it back. That's, it's an ultimate insult. And I, and I was as, and preparing for this time thinking, wow, Lord, how that older son must have felt when he heard this news. Now, of course, he did not know that he had repented. He did not know that he had repented first to God and repented to his father. He didn't know those facts. But still what he knew was what was rightfully his was no longer available. Church, this is what happens when we get the dangers of entitlement. We get confused. We're so excited about one thing, we forget something else. We're so, we're so excited about getting something, 
and after we've squandered it and getting grace and praise the Lord, that's wonderful. But church, those kinds of things, if it's, if it's truly God, it's not going to come at someone else's expense. It's going to be a gift from God. And if something's a gift from God, there's not going to be confusion over it. There's not going to be second guessing over it. There's not going to be strings attached. It's a gift from God. Here, certainly, we have a probate court problem developing. And it's gut-wrenching because of the dangers of, an, of entitlements. And then, let's continue on. Verse 28, but he was angry and would not go in. The response of the older son is furious. He's frustrated. He's broken. He's hurting. All the years of hard work has gone down the drain. Now some would say, well, it seems like he's pretty selfish. I would argue he was doing what he was supposed to do. Have you ever done what you're supposed to do in life and then get undercut at the end? That's painful. That's difficult. That's hurtful. Especially once you once you you find out that there there has been a back, you know something going on in the background or something going on behind the scenes. Here the the older son is he's angry and he would not go in. He would not go in. He would not go in and, and join the celebration. This was something that he was entitled to upon his father's death, and it's come prematurely because one, you know, at least in his mind at this point, has come home. He's come home after many, many years of wasteful living. Praise the Lord, he's come home. Praise the Lord, God is forgiving. He's graceful. But church, let me tell you, if you come down and walk down the red carpet of grace, God is going to forgive you, but he's also going to tell you to go make matters right with whoever you wronged. He's not just going to say to you, that's enough. Praise the Lord. You know, live however. He's going to say, go get right. Go talk to your wife. Go talk to your children. Go talk to your parents. Go talk to your boss. Go talk to your friend at school. He's going to, he's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to do those things. And he's angry and he's hurt. And he's, and he's frustrated and he wouldn't even go in to the party. Wow. Church kids of all ages, including adults, you're a big kid, adults, seniors. There's no doubt about it. We all have feelings. We all have ideas and perception. And perception becomes reality. You know, and, if, and it's, it's important that we begin to be mindful and think about others. Especially if the other person has been doing what they were supposed to do. And again, certainly, if God extends grace or wants you to express compassion and use something else that belongs to someone else, consult them. If it's God, that person will be, be, be moved himself and be willing to give the fatty calf. Will be willing to give the robe that rightfully belongs to them. Will be willing to enjoy the celebration. Why? Because they've been consulted. The dangers of entitlement say, well, don't worry about the other person. You just do whatever you want to do. That's, 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 that's very hurtful. That's very hurtful. For example, you know, Pastor Ben's got a nice office upstairs. Got an air conditioner in his office. I'm burning up. He's got a nice AC at 60 degrees in there. Well, I don't worry about that. We're just going to move his office out. I'm going to move in. Now, I can do that. But I'm sure he'd be, well, why didn't he ask me? If he had asked me, I would get up. I would have gave up the office. As a matter of fact, he did ask me. Are you sure you don't want to come in here? It's much cooler. You the pastor of the church? No, I'll be right here. I'm fine. By the way, we got a nice air conditioner, so we're cool now. <laughs> but for two years, it was hot. Right now, it's like, it was hot. His own wife's in there suffering while he's got a nice AC. <laughs> but you know, but you know, it would have been, if I had did something like that, he would have been pretty upset. Hey, why didn't you why didn't you just ask me? Why didn't you just ask me? Or Crystal's office down here. Say, no, boss, I, I was out here in the, I, I was over here where Chris was, out in the middle of no man. I called it no man's land. It was my office for a year. Say, boss, I'm going to go in that. I'm going to go back there. I'm going to move your stuff out here and see how you like it. That would have been distasteful. That would have been, that would have been wrong. That would have been not considering, you know, her well-being and her, her opinion in the matter. But church, 
when we get we, when we get so caught up and we get even in times of celebration as this story here, we we can easily forget the one who's doing what they're supposed to do. Here the older son is here. I can certainly understand why he didn't want to go in. Yes, it's his brother. There should have been excitement. But quite frankly, the older son is kind of out in the cold. The older son hasn't been consulted on things that rightfully are due him. And now this is Israel's culture. Now our culture doesn't work that way anymore. It doesn't matter. You know, we don't have uh, the old, some of the old timers still practice it. But for the most part, you know, the, the executor of the will does not have to be the oldest child. Usually it's the one that likes money and all the court stuff. And that's usually who takes that over. It doesn't all just fall to the to the oldest son. Okay, we don't live in that culture, but that is Israel's culture. So we have to understand it from their perspective. And here the older son is not going in. So what does the father say? Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Church, have you ever waited too long to deal with a problem that was brewing? Too late. Too late to, to come out now. Dad, you've cut the calf. Too late. You've, you've given up my robe. Too late. You've gone into celebration mode and you didn't care about me. Why do I want to go in there? Why do I? I've lost my entitlement and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And, and your son, your, your younger son, did everything he wasn't supposed to do and you're having a great celebration. Now, of course, if you compare that to God's grace, and this is usually the text you hear preached, was just that part of the Son coming back and the forgiveness of God and all that, but that's really not the full context of that passage. That's just taking a few verses and making it look good and happy ever after movie, but that's not really what's going on here. We did that this morning, and what? We got a son that's upset right now. There's, 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 there's another side of the coin. There, and the dangers of entitlement are huge are so huge, church. I pray this is getting, I pray it's not too too deep or too theological. I pray you're keeping with me here because this is important stuff. And he, the Father came out and pleaded with him. Verse 29, So he answered and said to his father, the older son speaking, quote, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. So that tells us that the younger son was gone for a long time. You know, someone asked me this morning, well, Pastor, after the sermon, you know, Pastor, how do we know it wasn't just six months he was gone? Well, because the Scripture says, after many years, I have been serving you. So we know that the younger son was gone for several years, perhaps even a decade. You know, we don't really know other than many years, you know, so it's more than just a few. So, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet, you never gave me a young goat. Parents, have you ever been in that place where your children, you've made a decision, your one child is upset and they come back while they're upset and you know you don't have a leg to stand on? You moved hastily, a poor decision. I remember one time, Many of you know I have a younger brother. He's 10 months younger than me. We're like, you know, we're like twins. We wore the same clothes till we were in fourth grade. Those little alligator shirts. And I got held back a year, so we were in the same grade. Everybody thought we were twins. No, I'm just a dumb one. And we're mom dresses her like till fourth grade. Till the first day of fourth grade, I finally convinced her to stop dressing us alike. It was bad. But one thing about my younger brother and I is that I'm a neat freak and he's not. And I remember one time, he didn't do his clothes, and my mother gave him permission to wear my stuff. We were in sixth grade, and I, you know, I like, you know, folding clothes, hanging clothes, all that stuff, and he just grabbed and went and grabbed whatever he could find and basically lived out of the dry. Pretty much what he did, his clothes never saw the closet. But we shared a room until my sister got married, and I took her room, but that was later, when I was in seventh grade. So I remember this in sixth grade. And my mother said, uh, Darren, just go ahead and wear his clothes. You wear more of the same size. We still do. You know, go ahead and wear his stuff. 
That wasn't a good moment. <laughs> Spilled chili down the front of it. I still get a choked up about that. <laughs> and I saw him, we had the same, we had different lunches. He had lunch, I remember like yesterday. He had lunch fourth period, I had lunch fifth period, we came in, and I saw him. And right away it was my shirt, because his shirt would have never been wrinkle free. I knew right away, my shirt, plus we rode the bus together, so I knew it was my shirt. And I saw all that. You should have saw his face. And I, but my problem was not with him. My problem was with my mother. Why did you let him do? Why didn't you at least ask me? Same thing I was talking about with my older brother. You know, that car would have been the real deal. But him and I were close. And we, you know, all this other stuff. And, you know, I never, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, Mom, why did you do that? You know how he eats. You know, why, why did you do that? You know, I, I thought I had a pretty just case. Until she said, if I didn't straighten up, I wouldn't be sitting down for a while. Then I got straightened out. But I, but I was I was coming back with something valid, and I remember my mother. You know, she was almost crying because she she she. I should have done that, Justin. Should have done that, but I didn't do it. It's only a shirt. You know what? Though parents, it's really important. Though in those silly illustrations, in those silly illustrations, it's really important for us to know with kids, no matter their age. In this case, we're talking about older sons now. You know, well into their adult years. You know what? That we have to take into consideration things that they're entitled to. We have to take into consideration, you know, things that are very logical to them. And and when they and when they come back with something that's that's you know what you're you're in the, just simply say you know what I made a mistake. Your mom's not perfect. Your dad's not perfect. If you tell your kid that, they'll have greater respect for you than you sitting there trying to shuck and jive them out of what they're saying or trying to make them feel wrong. They'll have a lot more respect for you if you simply say, you know what, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. Rather than sitting there and trying to, well, this is my house, and if, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's just going to push them away. That's just going to lead to the dangers of entitlement. And they're going to come back and say, well, doesn't my opinion count? Do you love, you don't love me as much as Billy over there, you know, or as much as Tommy over there, or Peggy Sue, or Billy Bob, or whoever. That's the things that happen. That's what goes on, and that's what's happening here. He says, I never trust her. Never transgressed your commandment at any time, and you you never gave me a young goat that I make make that I make make merry with my friends. Dad, I did all this. You never noticed. You never noticed how hard I was working for you to even take notice and say, you know what? You deserve to have a celebration. You deserve to to have some entitlement that's justified come your way with a young goat. You never even do that. You did, you did not do that. This, this father, in my opinion, did not understand entitlement at all. Remember his first mistake, he gave his younger son everything. Where the problem started was with him. He didn't have to do that. But then his, his other mistakes were he, he moved with celebration too fast. He gave away his son's entitlement, what was due him, his older son. He didn't realize that there was pain that was festering between the older son and him. Then he goes and has a great celebration and he, he doesn't understand why his older son's not coming in. The older son has just points and it's not setting in. And he says in verse 30, and this is a gut-wrenching verse, because basically now the, son's, the older son's lack of entitlement and the breakdown there is now going to produce sin because he's so frustrated. Church, this is what happens. Even when you believe you're in the right, if you don't take care of something that's festering in your own heart, it will become sinful. Even when you think you have a leg to stand on, it can be produced disrespect, which is what happened to me with my very own mother. Even when I thought I was justified and that such frustration was developing, it became to the point of just disrespect, which after coming right with Christ at 19, I had to go to her and say, Mom, please forgive me. But here, church, we find, verse 30, But as soon as this son of yours came, you devoured your livelihood, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. The livelihood of the father, he gave it all away. As soon as this son of yours, what he's doing is denouncing his own brother as if he did not exist. 
basically saying, Dad, I'm no longer your son. The double blessing, the fatted calf, the robe, the sandals, everything that was due me, you didn't care about that. You fallen prey to that. And this son of yours has devoured everything that you own. He's more special than I am, who's been loyal and faithful to the very end. And he says, but as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. It's a low verse, church. Let's us know the dangers truly of not understanding entitlement can even cause someone to denounce their own blood. And I'm here to tell you this can happen because I've seen it happen before. And it could very well happen to one of you unless we say, you know what, we have to understand entitlement. We have to understand the times that we're living in. A sense of entitlement and true entitlement. And, and here, church, it's not happening. It's not happening. And you killed the fatted calf. Notice verse 30 goes right back to what had shocked him when back in verse 27, when he heard the music and the dancing. And he had heard from the servant that the father had ordered the fatted calf to be killed. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Again, without consulting him. And he declares in verse 30, But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Verse 31, and he, the father, said to him, the older son, Son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. Again, too late. The father had a perception, while well, everything here is going to be his. He's working for it. He's going to be working. It's kind of like parents. If you don't tell your kids you love them, they may not know it. If you don't show them that you love them, they may not know it. Even if that perception is wrong, that could very well be the case. And sometimes it can be too late unless God does a miracle. And here the father's reply to the, son's, the older son's statements when it comes to what's in, entitled to him. Son, quote, son, verse 31, quote, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Really? Really? The father is looking at it from the big pers perspective. But the older son's looking, if that's the case, how come that fatted calf's not for me? You didn't even give me a young goat. Really? Now the father's thinking, son, you're going to have all this. You're going to have all this. But church, this is the thing that's really important. This illustration, this is coming from a teacher's heart as well as a, a parent now, so i got to get used to saying. So many times we, we, we spend so much time dealing with and trying to encourage, you know, someone that's participating in negative behavior. We're trying to instill them to change. We're offering pizza parties and money for A's and money for B's and all this other stuff. We're, trying to, we're spending so much time trying to deal with the, the negative situations that we forget to honor the positive things that are going on. I've seen that happen many times as a pastor, and as a teacher, and as a parent. Where there's so much, so much attention given to one who, who's really struggling and being disrespectful and all this kind of stuff. And then the one who's doing what they're supposed to do doesn't feel like they're loved at all. How come you don't take me out to pizza? I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. How come you don't come to me and say, I just want you to know I appreciate all that you do. I know I have to spend so much time with Billy Bob over here, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and I appreciate you doing what you're supposed to do. You know, and, and I appreciate you understanding true entitlement. I appreciate you understanding. These things cut to the quick, I know. But church, it's very important. It's very, it's very important that we as, as parents understand this, we as, which is why one of the things, as soon as we found out that, that Mary was going to have a baby, is that we came back and said, no, we don't want anybody 
showing favoritism to our child. Our baby is just as important as anybody else's baby here, or grandchild here. Very valuable. Our child's not entitled to anything more than anybody else is entitled to. You know, very, very important because I didn't want anybody developing a perception that was wrong. And for the record, many, they call them PK kids, pastor's kids. They're, they're put on this pedestal which will never reach it. And then upon their youthful years, they're gone faster than, you know, Grant went through Richmond back during the Civil War. They're flying out of it. Why? Because this place is this place that's unreachable to that pastor's kid, that pedestal that's up there, that sense of entitlement that's incorrect. You know, that's that's painful for that child to go through, and usually they rebel. Studies say that most pastor's kids don't walk with Christ. Matter of fact, as soon as they can, they're gone, which is so unfortunate. You know, which is why again we have to understand the dangers of entitlement. But the father again says in verse 31, we're almost finished. And he said to him, son, you have always, you are always with me. And all I have is yours. Think about that. If that's the case, if all I have is yours, why didn't the father consult? If the older son, and basically what he's saying here is, is kind of like indirectly passing the inheritance to him. If all I have is yours, if all I have... You know, the father speaking to the son, and the son saying, okay, it's all yours. Wouldn't you think you'd ask permission if it belongs to the older son already? Wouldn't you think that the father, I've heard it said, well, the father, the father, you know, he understood, and when he said all I have is yours, meaning that older son has everything, he loves him, he's going to give him everything. But see, that's not how the Jewish custom works. He got a double blessing. You know, that, that fact, those certain things were, that's how our culture works. So that's one thing that I think that as Americans we forget, and that is to understand the Jewish culture of that day so, so that we grasp fully what Jesus is saying here. When the Father said, all I have is yours, then basically what he's saying is, is that it belongs to you, older son, therefore I should be getting permission from anything because it actually belongs to you. He already gave away his younger son's possession, so now he's indirectly giving it all, you know, saying all I have is yours, but that's really not the case. He didn't consult the older son. That true sense of entitlement was not understood. Therefore, we have a major family domestic dispute that's taking place here. And then lastly, verse 32, Jesus writes, the father speaking, it was right that we should make Mary and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Yes, that's true. There should be a celebration, true repentance. But church, you can't ignore other people. When you begin to celebrate something positive and wonderful, you have to include everybody in that celebration. Before you have a celebration and before you begin to make merry and party, you have to consult the one whose, whose uh, possessions you are selling or that you are killing in this case. You know, you have to understand things that are entitled. That would be like, you know, if, if folks just began, you know, wanting to use the church facility here for whatever they wanted and didn't consult with the ministry team. You know, just taking matters into their own hands. Scheduling things and, well, you know, there's a, there's a plan to that, you know. And, and we, you know, there, there's things that need to, to make sure that that's okay. You know, uh, or if, you know, you began to, you know, uh, began to uh, let someone else uh, use someone else's property because you think it's okay and not even consulting them. Here, church, the father standing behind, behind his decision. We, it was right. We should make Mary and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I would agree that it's right to celebrate. But church, I don't think this father really understood entitlement even at this point. And notice, Jesus finishes the parable. Son comes home. Father's excited, which any parent would be, after seeing their child gone and wondering if they're even alive. But in the celebration, forgot the well-being of the older son. Forgot the well-being. And he still it was it, it still wasn't grasping. It still wasn't son. You know, son, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry I didn't ask you. Please understand what this meant. I'm sorry I never offered a young girl. I'm sorry that I didn't. I'm sorry you're feeling this way. Instead, he dispenses. this. I, I didn't. This is right what we did. We need to be married. We need to be glad. Your son, your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is now found, which is all wonderful. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.